State District Court of County Washington, State of Michigan. I'm a session on the county business. You may be seated. Oh, we got a problem. Yeah, we do. Because it's just that kind of day. Okay, I'm good. Jason, you know the exhibit still? Before I forget, you know the exhibit still? There on my desk. Court does call the case People State of Michigan versus Isaiah Williams. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Danielle Wilson on behalf. Good afternoon, Alex Peterson on behalf of the people. And good afternoon, Your Honor. Danielle Wilson on behalf of Mr. Williams, who is appearing live from the Washington County Jail. Yes, he is here, and so that the record is clear. Um, during yesterday's proceedings, Mr. Williams was here, tried to leave, did not. He stayed through the entirety of yesterday's proceedings. Today, shortly before the time at which these proceedings were to begin, the court was informed that Mr. Williams refused to come from come up from his cell. So the Washtenaw County Jail has been wonderful in making an accommodation. And so the court could elect not to have him here and present at all him, in essence, forfeiting his right to be present in the courtroom. However, uh, the Washtenaw County Jail has provided a tablet with the use of technology. Mr. Williams can hear, and if he does turn himself around, he would also be able to see the proceedings as they are going on. Um, so he is effectively participating. What we will be doing is we will be muting him so that he cannot speak back and disrupt the proceedings. But if it looks like he's going to say something, I'd ask the um, deputies in the Washington County Jail that if he does try to say something, if you could let us know so that we could address whatever issue he may have at that moment, if it's relevant to any of the proceedings. So having said that, is there any objection given the circumstances to proceeding in this fashion from the people? None from the people, please. Any objection from defense? Uh, not from defense, Your Honor. I would just ask if one of those moments does happen where he needs to communicate with me, that I'd be allowed to excuse myself to just log on to Zoom. We we will certainly, if he wishes to communicate with you, we will certainly attempt to try to accommodate that the best that we can. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you. Uh, we had concluded with the last witness, unless there's anything else preliminary. People were still in their case. You may call your next witness. And if you could please come forward and be sworn. See, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear and affirm the testimony you're about to give. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So you got. Have a seat. State your first and last name and spell it for the record. Inspector Sarah, say R-A-H, Krebs, K-R-E-B-S. You may inquire. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Inspector Krebs, where are you employed? I'm employed with the Michigan State How long have you been with the Michigan State Police? This will be my 23rd year. And is there any specific division or unit that you are currently assigned to? I'm currently the Chief Diversity Equity Officer for the Michigan State Police. Formally assigned to the missing persons unit. Okay. As uh, an inspector or an officer that's assigned to the missing persons unit, what would your job duties include? Uh, when I was in the missing persons unit, we um, were a missing persons clearinghouse and unidentified remains clearinghouse for the state of Michigan. And so we investigated both um, missing persons cases and unidentified remains cases to try to find a resolution. How long were you part of this missing persons unit? From 2014 to 2019 when I promoted out. As far as the case that we are here for today, did you have some involvement as far as being involved with the missing persons unit for a Olissa Williams date of birth, 8-10-1981? Yes. Can you tell me how it is that you became involved with this particular case? Detective Iverson from the Ann Arbor Police Department uh, contacted me um, and wanted to know if we had any unidentified remains cases that uh, could be Elisa Williams. 
um, asked me to kind of do a, um, a clearinghouse check on her case to see if you know we thought there were any remains within Michigan or even nationally that we um, thought could be her or any you know child abduction uh, abduction cases um, that we're currently investigating. So I did a scan back then on all the databases that we um, check for any cases that matched her and none matched at that time. And then I did that again yesterday. I checked um, the same three databases to make sure in the gaps since I left until um, the trial today, to make sure that there were no other cases and there were none. Before we talk about those three different databases, you left the missing persons unit in 2019, correct? So is 2019, am I fair in believing in 2019, that was the first time you had checked for the Olisa remains, or was it before that? It was before that. Okay. I believe it was sometime probably in 2016 that I did the initial check. And as far as this clearinghouse check, I think you indicated you did another one yesterday evening before testifying here today. Is that correct? Let's talk about these three different databases. Can you tell me what uh, one of these databases are that you checked? One is NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center. Uh, records are held by the FBI. It includes uh, both missing persons and unidentified remains records. Did you check the NCIS? Yes. Okay. And NCIC. NI NCIC. And in terms of in terms of checking it or doing a, as you said, a clearinghouse check, um, did anything um, in your check come up as identifying as matched to Alyssa Williams? No, ma'am. Okay. Let's talk about another database that you checked. Another database is the Davis database, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Person System. It's run by DOJ and NIJ. It's an online database. It's a uh, more relevant database for unidentified remains than missing persons. Tell us why it's more relevant. Uh, well, it has more records in the system than NCIC has for unidentified remains. And that is because a lot of medical examiners who uh, have the burden of identification in most unidentified remains cases don't have access to NCIC. Okay. So they use the NCIC. And in terms of um, NamUs, do you do have, have you yourself done any work in um, putting a backfilling or putting cases into that particular database? Yes. Can you tell us about that? I was uh, appointed back in 2007 as um, one of the state experts for NamUs to start backfilling records into it. Um, NamUs was a new database at that point. It is a publicly accessible internet-based database. Um, so when we were starting out back in 2007, we had to uh, manually enter all of the both missing and unidentified cases in it. So um, I started researching unidentified remains cases within the state of Michigan and hand entering them into that system. So um, upon yesterday's check, we have 334 cases of unidentified remains. Were there any particular cases that came up in your search that you um, cross-checked or referenced against Alyssa Williams' case? Uh, well, in this case, this is a, a juvenile child, so that uh, will exclude most of you know, the cases because most of them are going to be adults in, in this system. Uh, there were only seven juvenile cases entered into NamUs presently, and then I was able to go through all seven of those and exclude them individually. And so in excluding each of the seven cases, uh, I'm would I be correct in saying not one of those cases has come back as um, being identified as the remains of Alyssa Williams? Correct. Let's talk about the third da database that you've mentioned that you checked in and, and checking for the unidentified remains of Alyssa Williams. What is that database? The third database would be the National Center for Missing Exploited Children's Database. Um, so the Michigan State Police we serve as the Missing Children's Clearing House for Michigan, being we are the sole liaison between the National Center and State of Michigan and all the records. Um, I checked with the case manager that oversees Lisa Williams' case, which is a current case with the National Center. She's still considered a missing child. And um, just made sure that there were no um, pending investigations or cases that we were looking into. There were two um, cases that were cleared recently by DNA. 
uh, that people had um, stepped to Nickman. Okay. And uh, both of those were, were cleared by DNA. So no pending cases for the case manager. And I think the acronym you used was NICMIC? Okay. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. When you say in, in terms of after 41 years in that particular database, her case is still active as a missing child. Is it fair to say those cases remain active until remains are found? Do you, um, is there DNA also on file on a national database in terms of like, trying to identify remains for Alyssa Williams? Yes, and we have DNA from uh, Alyssa Williams' biological mother. It is in the CODIS database by DNA. It's running at the national level. Can you explain a little bit if people aren't familiar what, what CODIS actually is? Sure. Uh, so if we take DNA from a family relative of a missing person, like Elisa's mother. Um, her DNA would be profiled and it would be uploaded into the computer system that profiles that DNA and tries to match it to other cases. So um, her DNA is entered as a family reference sample in the CODIS system. That file in CODIS will search against the unidentified remains database, crime scene databases, all the other parts of POTUS to try to come up with a match. And as of today, there is no match. So between 2016 and, and as recently as yesterday evening, has your uh, work as, as part of the missing persons unit identified any unidentified remains either locally in the state or nationally been identified as that belonging to Olisa Williams? No. Okay. One moment. No further questions, thank you. All right. Cross examination. Just very briefly, Ron. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, is it fair to say that if you are not dead, or if you don't recognize that you are in fact missing, you would not be in any of these databases? Uh, it would depend. If you volunteer your DNA, mm -hmm. or if you have a reference sample, you would be in CODIS. Okay. Let's. I'm sorry. Assuming I didn't. I didn't. I didn't volunteer any of my DNA, I'm not um, missing and I don't have any remains, I would not be in the system, correct? Correct. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. All right. Inspector, thank you. May I call your next witness? People call Holly Wilson. What are they doing down there? They look. Okay. And please come forward, be sworn. Take a seat, raise your hand. Sound as well. Have a seat. State your first and last name and spell it for the record, please. Ari Rosen, H O L L Y R O S P E N. Thank you. Main court. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Miss Rosen, can you tell me how you are currently employed? And in what capacity do you work for MSU Safe Place? I'm a director. Do you uh, hold on any other uh, uh, jobs? Uh, the job as a director includes supervising all of the program, the staffing, the finances, the outreach, grant writing, that kind of thing. But in addition, I do expert witness testimony, and I'm on, I sit on various boards and professional groups. Um, how long have you been with MSU Safe Place? I've been there since the program started in 1994. And prior to that, I worked for 13 years at End Violent Encounters, which is the MSU program. It used to be called the Council Against Domestic Assault. So I've been doing this work for 42 years since 1980. 
Can you tell us a little bit about your educational background? Yes, so I obtained a bachelor's in social work from Michigan State University um, in 1981. And then I um, obtained a uh, master's in social work also from Michigan State University. As far as um, other sorts of training in terms of uh, for your background in working for MSU Place, uh, MSU Safe Place, excuse me, what kind of training and experience do you have uh, becoming the director for MSU Safe Place? Well, I'm a licensed social worker with the state, so I have to get um, continuing education every year. Um, in addition to the 15 CEUs or credits that are needed every year, I also attend a lot of other webinars and Conferences. You mentioned um, being an expert witness, but do you also train other other professionals in the field? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So for years, um, when I first started doing expert witness testimony in 2001, um, I worked with the Prosecuting Attorney Association of Michigan to train prosecutors across the state. I did this for many years um, on how to utilize experts. I also have been faculty for PAM for other programs as well like teaching prosecutors how to um, look for signs for domestic violence homicides and how to prosecute those kind of cases. And I've been faculty for the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence to teach new service providers about various topics. Um, in addition, I've trained law enforcement, um, different attorneys, defense attorneys, counselors or therapists, and different service providers locally as in the Lansing area as well as statewide. As far as you did mention, testifying as an expert witness. Have you been qualified in court as an expert witness? Yes, I have. About how many times, if you know? As of yesterday, 100 times, 62 times for prosecution, 23 times for family cases, and 15 times for the defense. Okay. Um, may I approach your honor? You may. Ms. Rosen, I'm approaching with a four-page document, document, excuse me, People's Proposal 59. Do you recognize this document? I do. What is that? That's my CV. Okay. Um, and this does this reflect your educational background, employment background, and, and the like? It's essentially a very, very um, detailed resume, essentially, correct? Okay. I'd ask that People's 59 be admitted into evidence. Objection or warrior? No objection, for example. 59 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Ms. Rosen, how, in terms of you being qualified this many times as an expert, is there a specific area of expertise you've been qualified as an expert in? Yes, in domestic violence and sexual assault cases, as well as trauma, <laughs> to explain um, non-intuitive victim response, perpetrator tactics, context, and other factors related. Your Honor, at this time, I'll, I'll turn over to Wadir to counsel in terms of qualifications for Ms. Rosen before I ask for her to be. Your Honor, for that purposes only, I'll stipulate your expertise. All right. Thank Stipulating you. Stipulating to the, okay. And again, if she, I had asked if she qualified in the wide variety of what she outlined um, in her testimony, specifically domestic violence, sexual assault, trauma dynamics, Your Honor. She is an expert. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Ms. Rosen, did you have an opportunity to review the case materials that we are here for in terms of Alyssa Williams and her mom, Denise, statements, police reports, um, timeline chronology, and the like. Yes. Did you also have an opportunity to meet with me a couple times and discuss some of the factors and the facts in the case? Yes. Okay. You mentioned working 42 years, I think it was, I mean, if my math is wrong, I apologize, with survivors interacting with domestic violence perpetrators, correct? correct. I think you said since 1981? Okay. Um, you also have experience, you mentioned, training service providers about these particular, uh, what we would call perpetrator tactics, correct? That's correct? Okay. Can you explain for the court what you would qualify or what you were defined as perpetrator tactics when we're talking about domestic violence or intimate partner violence. So it's any, any tactics or behaviors that are used by someone who is selecting, grooming, or abusing somebody that they are targeting. Domestic violence. Are all perpetrator tactics going to be exactly the same case to case or do they, do they vary? They vary. Okay. When you are providing this training to other service providers, um, are children ever part of the equation that you, you factor in when looking at particular perpetrator tactics? Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about more about that? Yeah, 
Yeah, so children are often used during a relationship that is abusive, and they often are used um, post separation after um, a victim and the abuser break up their relationship. So the children are used in a lot of different ways to punish and control uh, the adult victim. What kind of situations in your experience dealing? Well, let me ask this right that you have dealt with the practical side of domestic violence and the academic side. Is that fair to say? By practical, you mean real life yes. survivors and the academics. Yeah. Yes. You've worked in the shelter setting. You've worked in the academic setting, correct? Yes. In terms of, of working um, in, in sort of the real life setting, um, what kind of situations have you seen in your experience where an abuser might use children? Uh, to quote unquote punish the the adult person in the relationship. So abusers often will use children or pets and or pets um, to control the victim, to threaten to take the children or to take the children. For instance, if the um, victim is attempting to leave the relationship, um, they might uh, use or um, neglect the children or take the children to um, make sure that the victim does not feel intimidated and worried, worried about their children's safety in terms of um, child support um, or other issues. So it's often related to the relationship, child support, or arrest, calling the police on them and prosecuting. So using children to dominate and control the victim because a lot of victims are very concerned about the safety of their children. They can take a lot of abuse themselves, but when the children are threatened on them, that's a, a successful way to dominate and control. And is, is successful ways in dominating and controlling the victim, is that similar to how you would talk about tactics of using the children as leverage? Yes. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the acts of strangulation, if we could. Uh, did you, in, in reviewing the discovery, read some allegations of strangulation to multiple people that are involved in this case? Okay. Um, did you read it as involved to an ex-girlfriend and as to the mother of, of Olisa in this case? Let me ask about the term strangulation versus choking. In your expertise, is there a difference? Is it a different terminology? H help me understand that. Yeah, so choking is when food or some other object is lodged in one's throat. And so there's a gagging or choking reaction. Um, you know, it can occur with sexual assault when there's a forced object or penis, for instance, in the, but it's usually food that gets lodged in the throat. Um, then there's strangulation, which is putting pressure on one's neck and that's uh, oxygen. That can be done with a hand, with a leg, with ropes, with anything that restricts the um, ability to get oxygen. And that is very dangerous, resulting in either death, near death, or anything like that. Um, then there's suffocation, which is covering the mouth and the nose. Um, at the same time, so some people typically confuse strangulation and choking. Um, they uh, maybe because of the word choke, a uh, hold perhaps. But people, especially victims, usually use the language choking when referring to what they've experienced. Um, Have you found that in your experience dealing with survivors in, in shelters and, and the like, uh, that survivors will talk to you about being choked by their perpetrator versus strangled? Yes. Is strangled more often used as a legal term? Yes. Okay. In terms of you reviewing the documents in this case with the ex-girlfriend, Mary, is that the name you recall? Yes. Okay. Mary, in making some statements that the defendant made to her during a strangulation episode. Do you recall reviewing that? Is there any uh, significance in your mind, based on your expertise, to statements being made like this during a strangulation episode? So often when abusers strangle victims, whether it's in a domestic violence assault or sexual assault, um, Survivors often report that abusers are also verbally telling them ways that they should be a victim. So they literally are holding the victim's life in their hands, which is terrifying enough. But many times, abusers will also tell victims, I can kill you right or I can kill you later, or I can kill other people before. So there's lots of ways that um, abusers will add additional comments to the strangulation experience. And that escalates or um, increases the terror. Experience. You mentioned being in this field dating back to, I think, 1981. Have you seen a change in the way law enforcement and survivor advocacy groups um, deal with strangulation in the 80s 
versus today, even the 70s, if based on your, your research, um, versus the way we handle those kind of cases today. Yeah, so um, shelters started in the late 70s, early 80s in the United States. Um, I started working in the At that time, the shelter programs that I knew of, and I went to state wide coalitions, never asked about strangulation as a screening tool when the shelter takes and the same with the law enforcement, because we were review a lot of police reports and work closely with law enforcement and prosecution. In the past 10 to 15 years, there's been an increased awareness about strangulation being tied to the Alzheimer's homicides or fatality and a lot of trains that are in the community. that a lot of local law department law enforcement entities, not just in Michigan, but across the, the country, are now screening routinely for strangulation. And I know that a lot of domestic violence programs are encouraged to do that as well. In terms of your work, have you, we talked already about batterer tactics and, and the commonality of using children as leverage. Um, have you worked with a lot of quote unquote parental kidnapping cases and cases where children have been used in that manner? So I've, I've you know, worked with thousands, 5,000 domestic violence survivors since 1981. Um, and I would say that I have, I'm aware of many cases, um, under 100 <laughs> um, cases involving kidnapping at some point of either the parent and the children or the children. When there's an allegation of domestic violence occurring in a relationship, can you, can you talk about or address children being conceived outside a relationship and, and any potential risk factors that you've seen in that particular relationship? So there's a danger assessment scale um, where people can be trained on doing um, assessments with survivors to determine their legality. And one of the factors is having a child outside of the abusive relationship because abusers like to be the center of attention. They like to be in control. And if their children from a past relationship, they often treat those children differently, more abuse or neglect, or using them as leverage more um, than children they might physically have in common with. And then if children are conceived during the time that um, someone has left an abusive relationship, it is typically with an abusive relationship, people come and go many, many times. If, they, if the child is conceived in between that time while they've left and they are still then getting together with the abuser in the future, um, abusers often will target those children. Um, you know, that's also a legality factor in terms of the children. In terms of specifically not just children, but child abuse, in your work, have you seen any sort of correlation between domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and child abuse? Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so domestic violence, um, you know, is one adult abusing another, but the children also are affected and impacted and they are exposed to domestic violence. And even if they are never abused or neglected, they experience trauma. But many times children are also um, harmed you know, accidentally or intentionally by the abuser as a way to, again, punish or control um, the victim or just because they don't have patience and they are terribly identified. So there's lots of reasons why it's uh, child abuse is highly correlated with domestic violence. You've talked a couple times about the the term lethality. Is there something called lethality factors or lethality assessment? I'm not sure if I'm using the term right. Yeah, so there's lethality factors, and that's tied to the research um, from John Hopkins School of Nursing um, that was done many years ago has created a danger assessment scale or danger certification scale, Dr. Jackson. And there's many lethality factors, and some of them are weighed more heavily than others in the journey. Um, are, are threats of homicide or suicide part of those factors? Um, are access or use of firearms part of that? What about um, isolating in terms of isolating from friends or family, moving, moving people up to other locations? That is um, a domestic violence tactic. Um, it's not necessarily a legality factor, but it is a tactic. That is related to why victims often stay in the hospital. Is sexual abuse also part of uh, the lethal, excuse me, lethality factor assessment? Yes. Okay. You mentioned already pet abuse. Um, what about extreme jealousy? Yes, that is. Rage. That's a abuse tactic. Okay. 
We've already talked about strangulation. Would you consider that in your work part of a, one of the lethality factors? It's not, not my decision to evaluate that by myself. Yeah. Okay. Is drug and alcohol consumption um, part of what in, in your field they consider a lethality factor? It is way less than some of the other factors, but it is a lethality. You've already talked about um, children, children outside the relationship. Um, what about separation of the relationship when a partner chooses to leave the abusive partner? Is that part of the lethality factors? It is actually the most dangerous is when they leave the abusive relationship in my field it's called separation violence and that's where um, the risk for lethality increases at the time a victim leaves the abusive relationship and the domestic violence homicide risks are either for the victim for the victim's children for the victim's new partner or, or for other or strangers too the effects of trauma, uh, you already talked a little bit about children, even when they're not abused specifically in the intimate partner relationship, they can take on the effects of trauma. Um, the effects of trauma, is there a standard period of time that that lasts for a particular person who's abused? No, there's no way to know if someone is exposed to a certain experience, whether they will have trauma and how long it will last that very experience. Does trauma present the same for everybody um, in terms of things like emotions, memories, and things like that? Trauma will be quite varied, but if someone is experiencing trauma, um, they it does affect their ability to encode memories, to recall memories, um, to um, it affects their affect, which is their feelings, which is why you sometimes see people giggling over the blank affect, explaining horrific things. Trauma can also affect the brain in terms of mobility, being able to, to move or to speak. Some survivors say they can't even speak, and that's often related to the hormones from trauma. Um, so, and it also affects the complex decision. So when people are experiencing trauma, they experience kind of a fuzzy brain, they can't really think clearly. Um, but again, the responses that people have greatly depending on the experience. So that's the while they're experiencing trauma, and then there's a the long-lasting effect of trauma, and that very to some people will have anxiety, depression, intrusive thoughts, suicide. Um, self exciting There's a lot of different ways of trauma. And for some people, it's short term, and for other people, it lasts for In terms of, you mentioned kind of the, the fuzzy brain and decision making. Have you seen in your in your work it affecting actual memory and the ability to recall specific, even traumatic events? Yes. And so that's why law enforcement and other service providers, including advocates, are um, trained in um, how to interview um, in a trauma informed way. Um, so that there's open-ended questions, pace, and there's certain strategies that are used to help unlock the memory. And um, when see people are recalling traumatic events, they often don't recall the detail sequentially. Um, there might be gaps in their memory. Sometimes they remember some details one day, other days they remember other details. Um, so it's important to understand the effects of trauma on, on memory and recall and to help people unlock them. We started kind of this whole testimony off with what your expertise is. And one of the things you talked about was non-intuitive victim behaviors. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah, so non-intuitive means it doesn't make sense. So for instance, if somebody is being abused, people who either haven't been abused or have been trained on the topic or work in the field like I do, would just think it's just easy to leave. Why don't they just leave? Um, when in fact it's very difficult to leave. There's a lot of factors that keep people staying in abusive relationships and going back. Um, and so that's an example of an non-intuitive Let's talk about that specifically um, before we talk about a few other of the non-intuitive behaviors, reasons why, and I'm going to say why women stay, but men, men are also victims in these relationships, as you've seen, correct? But let's talk about specifically here why in, an, in a domestic violence relationship, why you have seen some of the reasons why women have expressed staying in a relationship. What are some of the things that you have seen some of the quote unquote reasons? So in, in, in a healthy relationship, if you decide it's over, the other party usually can be disappointed or sad that they will accept it. But when you tell an abusive person that the relationship is over, they're not going to accept it. And so it's not safe. The abuse doesn't end at the time that a victim says, I want out of this relationship. Um, it's an increased dangerous time for the survivors. They often are stalked. 
They often are charmed with lies and promises to them because of, again, if they're threatened, their children or pets or other loved ones are put at risk. So, so, so sometimes it's related to safety. It's often related to reasons because in an abusive relationship, even if there's not a lot of money in the relationship, uh, I'm an abusive party is going to want to make sure that the victim suffers financially. If they leave the something, control that, or the apart that, they're going to do that. So there's finances, there's safety reasons as well. You know, victims love the abuser, and when the relationship first starts, a lot of times it's really good. Um, that might be short-lived, a few days or weeks or months, but victims want it to go back to the, what it was like in the beginning. Um, and they are optimistic and hopeful that the person will change. It's also sometimes safer for a victim to just get back with the person than to live their life separately when they are always looking over their shoulders, worrying about being broken in, called might be assaulted, kids being kidnapped from school or daycare. Um, and so sometimes it just feels safer to go back. There's also community and family pressure to go back sometimes. So it's hard. Um, a lot of the uh, support people that they would have if they weren't being abused are cut off during the abuse, and all they have left is you know the assailant's family or the abuser's family and other people that they have relationships with and make pressure victims to stay back. So there's lots of reasons. And you talked about isolation as a particular you know, perpetrator tactic, um, can that also play into a role that I, the sense of a victim being isolated away from a support system? Yeah, so there's, um, there's different types of isolation. So there's physical isolation where an abuser will actually move someone to a different community or a different state or to a rural area where there's not a lot of transportation or access to people miles down the road. Um, so there's the physical isolation. Um, and then there's the emotional isolation. And every time um, a victim wants to call a sister or a friend or go be with their family or just go out. The abuser will become very abusive and jealous, and it's easier to just stay home and not have contact. So that's more psychological isolation. Um, and then also, if, if survivors want to go meet people, a lot of times abusers will go and remove them from that party or that social situation or embarrass them um, or create a scene where people are, other people are put in harm's way. So there's lots of reasons why survivors end up being isolated, but it's usually related to multiple tactics that the abuser uses to isolate them. In terms of seeing seeing the reason sometimes abused parties stay, do you see the same with them returning to the relationship? Yes. Okay. And in terms of that, do you also see any sort, do you see the a commonality with these abused persons um, delaying in disclosure or not disclosing at all these the, the abuses that they're suffering? Yeah, most uh, survivors do not share what they're experiencing because they um, know if they tell other people, people will say, um, and, or they might contact the abuser if they're in an unsafe situation. So um, I want to di differentiate disclosures from reporting. So sometimes they might have a close friend or someone that needs to know about what they want. Um, but then there's reporting, and that's more official according to authority, like law enforcement directors, um, child practices, prosecutor's offices, things like that. Um, and so a lot of people might disclose to a few people, but usually many, many survivors never. Thank you for that. One moment, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Thank you. No further questions. Cross examination. Very briefly, Your Honor. Oh, she won't exit. Sorry. Good afternoon. Um, is it fair to say that uh, your testimony today has been, um, I don't want to say primarily theoretical, but it's not based on any interviews with any of the uh, victims in this case, correct? That's correct. It's all that's general testimony versus case specific. So okay. And so when you say versus case specific, that means you haven't interviewed or talked to anyone involved in this case, correct? Okay, thank you. No further questions. No further questions. Thank you, Mike.